Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Sedna Fiati. Um, um, I am really honored to be here and to be a part of Sapamo's gathering. I've been about a part of Sapamo for a long time, uh, pretty much since it started. Charles met me and I was, you know, a lot, a lot younger and maybe had more energy and fewer wrinkles. Um, what are you talking about? I don't have any wrinkles. Um, but anyway, thank you all so much for coming um, and for being here and joining me. Right now in studio, I'm here with Makande Samamba, and we Hi. also have Ama Harris. Our panel today is called Continuing a Legacy, The Black Pledge and the Contributions of Black Women in Theater. So um, just to say a tiny bit about the Black Pledge. Um, that is something that you can go on and check out at theblackpledge.ca. And it's it's a movement and a document where we're really calling in live performance organizations and asking them to really dig into dismantling anti-Black racism within their organizations. So um, yes, with that, I think so much a part of the work that I wanna do as well with the Black Pledge is really to bring people together around um, Black history, around our legacies, but also around our futures. Um, so, I have two fantastic people here um, who I will introduce. Um, I feel like Ama is such a wonderful elder and has done so many great work for so, so much great work for several decades. And so she's like representing where we're coming from. And then I have Makambe uh, Simamba, who is a, a wonderful up and coming performer and producer and writer and, and all the things. And like Makambe, I believe you are the future because you are. <laughs> You are the future and you're the now, not even just the future, you're the now. So it's really great to have both of your perspectives on this panel to talk about, okay, where we're coming from and where we're going. So to be very official um, and to redraw some bios, uh, Ama Harris is joining us via Zoom. And uh, Ama is a producer, artistic director, playwright, actress, and educator, and is known as an award-winning cultural and social activist. Her work promotes positive imaging of Caribbean and African peoples toward the harmonious coexistence of peoples. The Hamilton Spectator says, Ama is a pioneer in the field of Black theater in Canada. Um, and her entire bio will be put in, uh, oh, Victoria said something in the chat. What did you say? That's, that's why I have this open. Okay, great, yes, all the bios are available here. So you can see even more. Um, it is an, a wonderful honor to have Ama on this panel today. Uh, I had a wonderful chat with her yesterday and we realized that uh, she was a friend of my father's, which is so lovely. My father died when I was quite young, but he was very active as an activist, as an artist. Um, and yeah, we share the same I, my middle name is Emma, you know, and her name is Emma. So, you know, I was also born on a Saturday, hence I got the name Emma, which uh, is the Ghanaian tradition. And so it it really warmed, very much warmed my heart that Emma was someone who knew my father and had collaborated with him um, because I don't have as, a lot of information about him because um, he died when I was so young. But um, I keep meeting people like Emma, like Kwame Williams, like Audrey Zina Mandela, who all were friends of his. And so that tells me that I'm on the right track. Um, well, let's hope. Um, I'm 40 after all. So, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much, Ama, for being here. Um, and then I have Mikambe Simamba. She is a Dora award-winning playwright and actor for her solo work, Our Fathers, Our Sons, Lovers, and Little Brothers, which will also be occurring at Black Theater Workshop Montreal in February. Yeah. <laughs> um, Selected acting credits include Serving Elizabeth, which you just did at the Thousand Islands Playhouse, Winners and Losers, um, which I also saw, saw you do at Summer Works, uh, Chitenje Story, which I completely mispronounced, and many, many others. Um, she was also the Urjo Karita Artist in Residence at the Tarragon Theater and has the Black Stage Pass podcast account. Where could they find that podcast? You must tell us. Um the internet. <laughs> oh, okay. Is it on Spotify? Um, it is on SoundCloud. It's on SoundCloud? Okay. All right. Wonderful. If you go on the Cahoots Theater website. It should be there. Yeah. If you head on over to cahoots.ca, um, you can hear you and it is uh, you and Kwaku, right? Kwaku. Yeah. You and Kwaku, um, another Ghanaian. So very proud. 
good job <laughs> on, on the podcast. Um, and that's such a wonderful idea. Uh, so yes. All right. So just to give some context, where are we coming from? Um, I love talking about these kinds of things because it's not what I learned in school and what I should have learned in school. Um, so when we're talking about the contributions of Black women in theater and live performance on a whole, um, it's important, I think, to really think about overall, like, what was happening? Where were we going? Where were we doing? What, where, how did we get here? Um, I think an important part when we just even talk about theater in Canada, this land we call Canada, um, as of course to say, number one, the Indigenous people were here, are here, and they have been practicing all kinds of artistic practices on this land that predates colonization. Um, so there's that. <laughs> um, and when we're talking about the Black experience, I think the diasporic experience in regards to live performance and theater, I think what's really important is um, I really feel and know, we all know deeply that, you know, performance, storytelling, art, style are like baked into the DNA of who Black people are, you know, so we are going to do these forms um, because that's who we are. That is, you know, goes back to time immemorial <laughs> for people of African descent. It is a part of how we live. And so even with the disruption that is colonization, these traditions continue. And so no matter where we go and what we do, Black people will always have storytelling, um, dance, music as integrated as a part of our being, our very being and how we are. So with that, I mean, thinking of the history of Black people on this land that we call Canada, um, you know, I feel like I will place this and say, A, that most of my information is from Ontario <laughs> and from Toronto even specifically. And I know that there are other, there's so much more uh, Black history that spans from coast to coast. Um, I mean, I just don't know but that's okay. <laughs> I will fill in the gaps and learn. Um, but I will say that the things I'm talking about are, you know, so Ontario specific um, with a dab of Montreal in there. Um, but I think it's important to start and say in terms of the, we kind of start when we think of art in Canada, it, we do start at like the 1951 and in, in terms of the Massey Commission. So that was, you know, a commission that um, a report that was commissioned to talk about what was happening in art in Canada at the time. And it recommended, thankfully, that the government start actually supporting artists who live here, because a lot of the art that was happening wasn't supported by the government, I don't think, and it was very ad hoc. And so we had the creation of the Canada Council. And also at that time, what you'll see is in 1960s and then, and most in the 70s too, but definitely the 60s is the creation of sort of the large regional theaters. Um, so like Stratford and, you know, Neptune, et cetera, those all kind of started in the 60s. And then in the 70s, in terms of the history, we saw like kind of a, contra, a bit of a countercultural movement where we had like the theaters in Toronto that are like Tarragon and Factory and Passamari, stuff like that. But I mean, in this time as well, while this kind of theater was being established, um, you know, Black folks were very much left out of it. And not to say that things were happening, of course they were, but they weren't recognized by the arts councils at that time. And so there had to be so much activism to get the arts councils to the point where they are now, where they fund our work, understand what we do, don't consider it community, community work, et cetera, even though it is community work. But I mean, for them, it's a pejorative word that they say <laughs> to say that work isn't professional, you know? So when we're talking about that, um, I think what's also important to say is that in the 60s and all, up until the 80s, we had like a major immigration of people of African descent from the islands and from and from the continent as well you know people were coming here in very large numbers that is when my mother came <laughs> that is when my father came you know my mom places um she came here from Trinidad in about 1971 and she was amongst various people of African descent who descended upon um Canada and you know Ontario and various provinces and started you know and stayed here and so because of that they brought their traditions with them you know so a key point, I would say, is in 1968, we had the Trinidad and Tobago Association in Montreal, which is the precursor to the Black Theatre Workshop. 
And uh, so from there, as we can say as early as the 60s and probably even before we, we can say that shows were happening, performances were happening, people were coming together to make things. Um, and then in 1973, Black Theater Workshop was founded by Vera Kujo. Um, and Theater Fountainhead was also founded not too far after that. So 1973, y'all, this is what we don't hear in the textbooks of Canadian theater. We are not included, and these are such key people and key dates. Um, and in the 80s, um, as, Am as Ama will, will talk about, we saw the beginnings of theater in the rough, um, as well as Ama did such great work and talked to me about how theater at that time and what the work that she was doing, it was political, you know. Um, it was really trying to say something about what was happening at the time um, and really involved with the South African apartheid movement. Um, and during this time, Black Theatre Canada was very active. And so a lot of the folks that we'll see after this, <laughs> Philip Aikens, um, Audrey Zina Mandela, folks like that were also involved, um, Janet Sears, were all involved with Black Theatre Canada, you know. So in the end, in the 90s, what we also see, especially in Toronto, um, but probably across Canada, but certainly in Toronto was major political uprisings to address anti-Black racism. Um, as a point of reference, it's really great. I always think of the fact that um, that uh, the Confronting Anti-Black Racism Unit, uh, as a part of the city of Toronto, one of the first things they did was read and do recommendations from reports that had already existed, of which one of them was from the 90s. Uh, Stephen Lewis um, commissioned at that time to say, anti-Black racism is alive and well, and these are some things we can do. And so yeah. Um, Reverend Anania, who I, I can as such a wonderful mentor said, we're not doing any new reports. All we need to do is look at the old ones. So if we think about that in the 90s, obviously theater and theater artists and black theater artists were responding to that and were part of those movements. And Ama can speak more to it. Um, but there was a lot happening politically during that time. And then um, in about 2000, uh, we see the beginning of Obsidian Theater Company. And so that was a group of various theater artists who came together and said, we're gonna create a theater company specifically for black work. Um, and so, and also during that time, there was wonderful work by Janet Sears, um, you know, Adventures of a Black Girl in Search of God and Harlem Duet, um, as well as work with To Be Young emerged at that time as well as such a strong voice and Trey Anthony with the kink in my hair. Um, we also saw things like fresh arts, which is something that both to be and when you uh, will talk about as such animation as well. That was like a program that they participated in that really was so helpful to their development as artists. So it made them be like, we can do this. So that happened in the 90s and too, as well as like the Raisin Ensemble, which I was a part of um, later than the, uh, the 2000s. Sorry, we're in 2000s. Um, and so, yeah, that too was through Be Current. Um, and Be Current started in the 90s. Um, that was a company started by Audrey Zina Mandela. And uh, that was also such a space where we see some folks like Raven Dowda and others, um, Debbie, uh, Rainey, <laughs> uh, Trey, they all came out of Raisin Ensemble. Um, and that was a space for Black women, for us to be able to really have our voices and to learn from each other and all kinds of things. Um, the 2010s, which, you know, just happened, y'all. It's like 2021, but still we can look back because it's, it's a good, it's a solid 10, 11 years ago now. Um, you know, during that time, we saw some really wonderful works come to the forefront. Um, Debi was really busy, I think, at the end of 2000s, like around 2008, 2009 with um, Bini to Africa School, and then that eventually became Wata School. And so she has like nurtured a whole generation of artists who are on the come up now. Um, unfortunately, she couldn't continue the work with Wata Theater. She didn't feel like she was, uh, Wata was appropriately supported and it wasn't. And you know what? Black Theatre Canada would say the same. <laughs> I'm sure you know that they were not appropriately supported funding wise to be able to continue their work. There was other wonderful pieces that happened during that time. Calpurnia, Venus's Daughter by Megan Swady, Sabi Up the Garden Path by Lisa Mombaum Bowen, who knew Granny. Um, other Side of the Game, which won the Governor General's Award by Amanda Paris. Um, Promise French for Apple, which is such a fun show. I don't know if you know Liza Paul and, and Bahia Watson, as well as we saw the all kinds of revivals of work. There was certainly more than one revival of Raisin in the Sun, um, of uh, for colored girls who've considered suicide when the rainbow's not enough, um, as well as a lot of American work. 
I'm, I chose not to talk about American work that we've done in this. <laughs> Evan is giving me a snap. I'm choosing not to talk about those works, but to say, of course, they're important, but really this focus is on Canadian work. I personally, that's what I want to see more of. I want to see more of our Black Canadian women and men, everybody to, I want to see those works being produced more often than once, you know. Um, so that, that's something that I feel like really kind of characterized the 2010s is that there was works being produced and there was works being presented, but uh, they got like one production, you know what I mean? Um, so um, and then now, um, in the last few years, there's been some amazing works, Serving Elizabeth, which uh, uh, Makambe has been a part of, that has another production coming up. That'll be production number, what, three, um, that's happening in the West Coast. Um, we also see things, let me look at my little note so I don't forget. Oh, yes, Control Damage, which happened by Andrea Scott. Um, sorry, Serving Elizabeth was by Mar Marcia Johnson, and she's written several plays um, over the years. Um, several, several, um, you know, her work dates back to the 2000s at the very least. Um, Control Damage by Andrea Scott. She's also written several plays. I directed Every Day She Goes <laughs> with Night with Theater, which she co-wrote with Nick Green. Um, that, that is going to have another production very soon. And that's, um, that was presented in 2020, right before the pandemic at the Neptune Theater. And then of course I put Our Fathers, Our Sons, Lovers and Little Brothers, um, because that's a door, a winning work by Makambe. <laughs> Um, and as, as we said, it's going to be at Black Theatre Workshop in Montreal. And then upcoming, we have um, Our Place, which is going to be at Theatre Passmarai, written by Kanika Ambrose. Um, so there's all kinds of work happening that is written and created by, uh, by Black women, you know. So our contributions to theatre is, is great and is worthy of talking about and really about really moving toward like how do we get more support? How do we get more? How do we make sure that the work gets more than one production? How do we just support us in saying what we need to say? Because I've, having had a good thought about it in terms of Black women and our work, um, you know, it's more than, it's like as Black people on a whole, we don't often have the luxury of just creating for creating sake. Our work needs to say something. Um, it's political, it responds to the times, it responds to what's in our hearts and minds, it responds to hopefully what the community needs. Um, so it's important, I think, it's deeply important for our work to actually be supported, highlighted for us to be supported as artists and various practitioners. Um, we're in a very special moment right now as well, where we have six Black women artistic directors. And honestly, it's both a mixed blessing because it's wonderful that there's this many artistic directors who are black women in Toronto, but it's also just like, this has got to be one of the most difficult times in live performance. And so what a time for black women to be leading. It's like, thank you. We're gonna take the time when funding, like we're not sure what's gonna happen in funding in the future in terms of a recession could happen. We're dealing with this panorama. And so, yeah, this is the time for a black women to lead. But if there's any time we, we can lead at any time, so we can certainly lead us through these difficult times. But uh, a huge shout out to Mumbi Tindibieba, who is the artistic director of Obsidian Theater, Wayne Mangesha, who is the artistic director of Soul Pepper, Sadie Berlin, who's the artistic director of Be Current, Tanisha Tate, the artistic director of Kahoot, Karine Ricard, who is the artistic director of Theater Afro Francais, um, and Janelle Cooper, who is the artistic director of Randolph. Um, and, you know, there's one man too. <laughs> Mike Payette, who's the artistic director of Tarragon. Um, some other artistic uh, leaders, I'm always like, uh, I was looking at a thread because Sadie posted on Facebook. I get information from Facebook, y'all, I'm not gonna lie. Um, and was just saying, you know, pointing at this moment of, wow, do we realize how many black artistic directors there are right now? And um, Diane Marie Bridge was like, don't forget about the associates. So shout out to the associates. Diane Marie Bridge, who is at Luminato, Liza Paul, who's um, at Theater Center, Kanika Ambrose at Necessary Angel, um, and Shona, oh gosh, I forgot Shona's last name, I should have put it in there, but Shona is um, Technical Director at Young People's Theater, and uh, La Mea, who is the Executive Director at Tubi Theater in Halifax, and me, I'm at Nightwood as the artist, <laughs> I'm the artist activist and resident at Nightwood Theater. Um, yeah, I chose that name for myself, I could have been our associate, 
artistic director or something like that. But I, I, I really wanted to bring activism and art to the space. Um, that, so that's why I chose that for myself. So yeah, anyway. So, at, you know, some key leaders that are, of course, worth shouting out some folks whose shoulders on which we stand are like Alison Seeley Smith, who was the artistic director of Obsidian and also um, and also a, uh, also a wonderful actor and uh, somebody who was very seminal in Obsidian's founding. Um, of course, Audrey Zina Mandela, you know, the founder of Be Current, Janet Sears, who's written several plays and now works at U of T as a professor, um, Diane Roberts, who was the artistic director of Urban Inc. and a parent pioneered the Legacies Project, a way of training actors and tapping into our legacies. It's a wonderful, wonderful technique and, and process. And uh, Roma Spencer, of course, um, who had her own theater, Theater Archipelago, and continues to make theater. Um, Vera Kudjo, who was the founder, as I talked about, of Black Theater uh, I was gonna say workshop, it's not Black Theater Canada. And uh, of course to be young and uh, yeah, I probably missed a lot of people, but that's okay. Cause there's actually so many. And there is a wonderful, wonderful list created by Amanda Paris that I encourage you all to go look up. And she lists like black women playwrights. Like she makes a whole amazing list of, of so many people um, who, who are all worth mentioning. Um, and then there's a wonderful documentary that I have to talk to Audrey Zina Mandela about making more available to everybody. And that's called On Stage Black Women. And so Audrey made this documentary in the 90s to just document that important moment I was talking about when we had all kinds of Black theater being created and it was reactive and it was of the moment. It was responding to what was happening politically. Um, all kinds of things were happening at that moment. So um, right now it's available on V-Tape um, for like wider um the distribution if anyone like has a school or something that they want to um that they want to screen it for you can go there um but uh but yeah we should all be able to see it so audrey we'll talk but anyway um but yeah i'm gonna put it over to the panelists now because i've spoken a lot and i've really hopefully given some deep context as to you know who we're dealing with you know we're dealing with true black excellence here um and it dates back it dates back <laughs> It dates back to forever, but certainly dates back at least 50 or 60 years of Black women really holding down theater. Um, so yeah, but you know what? I'll put it over to Makambe uh, first and tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, how did you come to theater? Um, the only way that I could say I really came to theater was like mm, the universe did something. And then I just like woke up and I was like, I guess this is my life now. And this makes a lot of sense. It's, it's been a really incredible journey, but pause, rewind, side conversation. Thank you, Sedna, for all of that context. That was really amazing to be able to like, I was very much a nerd in theater school. Like I got a lot of A's and theater history like aced it, but there's so much even like within that research and just what I've done in terms of my own research that you have continued to like enrich. So like, thank you for doing that. Oh. Um, no problem. I mean, yeah. we can wax poetic about, you know, the farm show. <laughs> the farm show. <laughs> or something like white Canadian history, because that's what that is, like white Canadian theater history. But, you yes. know, we have a whole other, like, yes. side that was happening, like, pretty much parallel, because they weren't really paying attention to what we were doing. And who cares anyway? Uh -huh. um, that, that, you know, that we all should know, you know? Absolutely. And I go, like, what? Like, if first year Makambe had had that, I might have been... I don't know, jumping into stories of my people or just realizing that there's, there is space for me that already exists in a way that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I was like, I guess I'll just do it and be lonely. And then I like was like, <laughs> oh, there's actually lots of black creators. Um, it's not always reflected in terms of like who's programmed, but I, I didn't know that, I didn't know that we were out here and we've been out here. Um, Oh yes, hi, I'm Makambe Kesamamba. I'm out here. <laughs> My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am an actor, creator, performer, storyteller. Sometimes those words feel limiting because I just feel like I'm a vessel for all the stories. So however it is that they want to come out, um, I, I would like to help them come out. So yeah, I am a creator. Um, I was born in Zambia and raised in the Caribbean. And I've called this place called Canada home for about 12 years now. So I kind of feel 
kind of global citizeny. Um, and I think that that perspective has really influenced my artistic practice and just like my the way that I think about perspective, because I think that there's um, a privilege of being able to, like, as a really, really young person, to see and immerse myself in like different cultures and just see that there are different ways of seeing things, doing things, eating things, thinking about things, um, expressing love, expressing art. So I think that um, just moving around like that as a little person and just being able to soak up all of these different shades of Black people. It was good for me. I liked it. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. um, yes, uh, I, I've i been in Toronto for a few years now. Uh, the work that I'm most known for is called Our Fathers, Sons, Lovers, and Little Brothers, which explores the first moments of afterlife of a Black teenager who was shot in Florida in 2012. Um, I'd like to talk about that work for a moment, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, I created a solo show. Um, solo shows are my thing, but they became my thing because I went to school in the University of Lethbridge and I was the only Black performer for some miles. So. I have never experienced that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sure nobody knows what it's like to be the only Black person in the room. Yeah, um, that's so, so rare. Explain to you what that's like. Um, so, <laughs> Um, I had all these stories and this desire to write and this desire to write for my people, but nobody to cast in the plays. And I was like, I have some great teachers and great professors who are like, I don't know this experience, but you should read these plays. I'm like, thank you for introducing me to these people who I didn't know about or, or just being able to like, like, thank you for encouraging me to like think big, even though that's not physically what's in front of me. So the solo show became a form that I was really attached to because I was like, I could be black, I could write the play, I could be in the play, and then like we can cast the play and do the play. Whereas writing other things, we wouldn't be able to find humans for them. And we weren't going to do any shenanigans where we are putting any Chads or Tylers to be playing the Fumis and the Coffees, you know, doing it. Um, so this, the solo, like solo shows are um, really special and I'm glad that I was challenged to sort of stumble into them because it's been a really magical adventure. Um, all of my work in some shape or form explores ancestry, um, questions ancestry, investigates ancestry, is always trying to find different ways to tap into the power of ancestry. And so our fathers, sons, lovers, and little brothers is no different. Um, I also like write other things and act in other things that I would be happy to talk more about but I'm really feeling that our fathers is on my mind also because I'm about to share it in a tour um, next year so um, I don't know if you knew this but so uh, our fathers will be presented at the push festival in Vancouver before doing a school tour with black theater workshop um, and then coming to the tarragon and then going to theater Aquarius Hamilton. so if you're in any of those places come hang um, wonderful yeah I just Great. think black people are the best I think stories are the best and it's a really exciting time for me right now because I feel I just I just feel like I'm really seeing an exciting way in which creators are just tapping into a really 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 powerful wave of something like there's an awareness and there's an amount of history and there are 100% shoulders that we stand on. There are some really incredible mentors who you could be like, hi, Uncle Philip, um, how do you talk about this contract where they are? <laughs> like there are people that we can call on and there's more than one person. Um, it felt like, yeah, there was a time that I just felt really, really alone in my identity. And I was like, I'm still going to do it, but I guess I'll be lonely. And it doesn't have to be that way. So this panel makes me really excited. Um, being reminded of everything that has come and led us to this point makes me really, really excited. And the future makes me really excited, not just for myself, but all of the, all of the people who are coming after me. Wow, wonderful. Thank you so much. I could pick up on any number of things that you said. <laughs> but um, and I will, but uh, let me put it over to Ama. Um, Ama, hello. Thank you so much for being here. Um, yeah, tell us how how did you come to theater? If you, okay. Um, I came to theater from from home, from Dominica. Where's Dominique? Where's Dominique? 
In Dominica, we have an original language which is derived from African, French, and Kalinago, the original people of Dominica. I'm 74. I came here in 1970. I got a scholarship to go to the BAM School of Fine Arts and, and went there. But what really be, uh, encouraged me, I first thank God for the talent that he gave me and the inclination, because that is where my inclination came from. And I have a mother who was an artistic person and uh, came from an artistic family where everybody had to play music. Her mother was an organ player, played the organ in the church, which of course, in the 1800s, that would be a big thing. And um, mom took part in, in plays. She went to boarding school in Jamaica um, and took part in plays. And when we were, uh, we were born, most of us, Dominica, because daddy is Dominican, uh, he would sit and enjoy eight children performing. We, you know, we, we had a full production company. You know, there were eight of us. Um, so we were very encouraged as far as theater and the arts were concerned and um, storytelling. My mother was a storyteller. I, we are storytellers. We are storytellers out of our culture. You know, um, I, we, if you listen to African people tell us stories, very few of them sit, the older ones, they got to stand and tell the story. They haven't gone to any theater school. That just came from God. And that's the same in the Caribbean. We, we must stand up and talk. <laughs> okay, and tell the story because we are storytellers. I just um, celebrated with Dr. Rita Cox, who's from Trinidad, and they put out a CD um, uh, called Wit and Wisdom. Uh, she was the person who really brought Parkdale Theatre to what it was and had the first big collection of African materials, African being from the, whether it was from the Caribbean or the continent. Um, so I got all of that, but above that, I got social activism from my mother and father. Strangely enough, in those days, they wouldn't call you a social activist, but that's what they were. They, if they saw something that needed to be done, they did it. And nothing stopped them. I didn't know what it was to decide to do something and feel, feel that something was going to be in my way because I wasn't brought up like that. It's some parents who decided this is what had to happen because this was wrong. And so they took it in hand and made it happen. So when I arrived here, I, I came here to study. And in my young day, I, I just put uh, the, the New York and everything and Canada in one because mom and daddy met uh, uh, during the depression in New York. And um, they got married and that he decided he wasn't raising children in the US and went back home. And um, so, so for me, I knew a lot about black theater because it was, it was rich in New York. And in my little head, <laughs> I was coming here to do a degree in theater and then go into professional theater because there would be all these black theaters. And then, oops. <laughs> There was one that had just started and it was Black Theatre Canada. And it was straight up the street from the Faculty of Education. In those days, it used to be at uh, Spadina and Blow. And it was literally five minutes away and they had just done Malfiti, their first production, so to speak. And I walked up there in April and uh, Vera Kojo said to me, I'm looking for someone to work with me and develop this company. And I just looked at her and smiled because I had started a theater at home with, of course, you can't do those things alone. Alwyn Bully, his wife, Anita, this time she was Astafan, Errol, uh, and other people, a number of people. And we had started this company. And um, then my dad, we own land in, in Dominica. And so when daddy began to get high blood pressure and have problems, and it was way out of the city. Mommy said, you've got to come to the city. And she used to be talking all over the country. She, she learned the language by two years when she was in Dominica and she spoke it fluently. And so he said to her, well, you're going to have to give up some of what you did, are doing. I was a young, I was a teenager. I was what, 19 or so. And people turned to me then to, to, to do what she was doing. So I had to go out and start talking to people. I also began to teach right away. So I was teaching high school. I was doing all of this talking and I thought, when I go to Canada, it's me one on God walking. 
I don't want any responsibility but for me. So when I was through a degree and I walked into Black Theatre Canada and she said that, I thought, God, you have a funny sense of humor. I don't want to do this, but it was necessary. And so the next person who really had a lot of influence in my life uh, was Vera Kojo, because she, I, I watched her. And though she at that point didn't see herself as an activist, she was just doing what was necessary. She was an activist. When they tried to say to her, the, the powers that be, why, why Black Theatre Canada? Why can't you give it a different name? She said, well, it's Black. Why would I give it a different name? And I saw her fight and fight, and then they wanted Jeff Henry and herself to form one theater. And she said, well, when we look around, there are so many white theaters. Have you asked them to join? We're not, you know, identical twins. We are, we're doing professional black theater with our own concepts. And so herself and Jeff really supported each other. I watched that and saw the social activism and became part of that and actually co-directed the theater. Um, somebody else I should mention is Mabel Cordero in Dominica. Mabel Cordero was a friend of, of our family. Uh, she was what would have been called someone from the upper classes in, in those days. And she would wear the traditional dress, which is based on African origins and teach us all the cultural songs and have us learn all the cultural dances and did not care what her friends said. And she was one of my mother's closest friends. They were like two little renegades. <laughs> and she did so much for us, for thousands of girls in Dominica, being proud of who you are so that even now, if there's a, a special function in for Dominica, I, will, I recently used my traditional dress to deliver the independence speech. And so it's a pair. And so all that activism for me is just natural. It's just something you automatically do for my family because my whole family is like that. My sister is like that. My six brothers are like that. So that's my influence. Vera Kodjo became a big influence for me. Rita Cox, Dr. Rita Cox became a big influence for me. Um, and people, uh, young, younger people like Motion inspire me. Uh, young people like Aita Sadhu with a different book, like uh, The People's Residence. She's doing such an incredible job with that. Um, there, there's so many people who inspire me since then. There are people who are on my board uh, for Theatre in the Rough. I formed Theatre in the Rough after leaving uh, Black Theatre Canada and Black Theatre Canada The Close, and I started Theatre in the Rough, which was really a touring company. And I guess I'll get a chance to go into that a bit later. Um, but it was, it was fascinating, the number of people who were scared to be part of Theatre in the Rough, but then the number of people who wanted to be because it was making a statement and doing something constructive in the Black community and beyond, and beyond to the general public because we were not in isolation. But I'll go into that a bit later. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, Ama, I have so many things to ask you, <laughs> but <laughs> we're like limited on time. I, I could ask you so many things. Um, but you know what? A question that I didn't send to you all, but I do have for both of you. Um, and Ama, um, I'd love for you to answer this first and then, you know, the comic, get your answer ready. <laughs> but tell me about, yeah, what have been some of the major challenges in, in your journey through all of this? Well, my journey at home was fine. It was very accepted. It was beautiful. It was very encouraging, etc. My journey up here was really quite interesting. I remember when I was going to University of Windsor, I went to University of Windsor and then I did a uh, a first degree there, and then I did a second degree at Faculty of Education in Toronto, and then another one at York University. But when I was in Windsor, I, I was doing two different uh, subjects. I, I'm a science person, and I'm a theater person, like my mom. And um, I therefore didn't take fine arts. 
at Windsor, I took a major in theater because if I did fine arts, I would not have been able to do my science subjects. <laughs> but nobody knew that I was doing that because the science people wondered, what are you doing though? Because I see you in some of my science courses, not in all. And the theater people were like, hmm, what are you really doing? And this day <laughs> I, was, I was simply walking past and where all the theater people were being theater people, which I had nothing to do with me. Okay. And this man came up to me and he said, Dr. Piscato is here. And I had studied Dr. Piscato in theater history. And he himself had died, but his wife was alive and she was continuing the foundation in New York. And we had a, a University of Windsor used to have a professional theater attached to the fine arts department. And they had a theater just like the Royal Alec type of theater downtown. And she was doing Jean Paul Sartre's The Flies. It was what uh, her husband and Brecht did during Nazi occupation of France, actually. And he said, why don't you go on cast? I said, oh, they're having auditions? He said, yes. I said, well, I, I didn't put down my name for an audition. He said, it doesn't matter. Wait for that person to come out <laughs> and just go in. And I laughed. I thought, he sounds like me. So I did that. And I walked in. And Dr. Maria Piscato was sitting there. And this young woman came in and said, oh, I, I'm, excuse me, I have this appointment. And Dr. Piscato said, wait outside. Ama, come in. <laughs> and I thought, yes. We spoke for a long time, actually. And I got the part of Clytemnestra. And it was an incredible experience. I was one of the only ones who got a very good uh, review in the press. And I thought, yeah, anything is really possible. So that was really strong for me. But then when I came up here and began to watch what was going on, I realized that in Toronto, the good, if you were a black person, they didn't see you as somebody who could be a lead. And that was one of the reasons why Black Theatre Canada was formed. Because except for Ernie Schwartz, who had a theater at that time and would cast Vera in a positive role, and the Caribbean theater that used to happen, she couldn't get work. And she started Black Theater Canada. And um, also, I'll never forget, she sent me down to CBC and said, why don't you go down to CBC? You have such an incredible uh, resume. And when I walked in, the head of the department said to me, we do not use black people. Just so. I said, you're kidding. She said to me, you are one of the most qualified people who have walked in here, but I'm telling you for sure, we don't use black people. She said, however, we are changing all of that over the next few months, come back then, which I did. And I, I have to say, I was one, Vera and myself were two of the only people getting lead roles in the seventies at that time. Uh, there was also, I know Black Lives Matter is happening now. There was a huge movement in the 70s, a massive movement in the 70s. Uh, marches, all kinds of things, Dudley Laws, Charlie Roach, all people like that. You know, Akua Benjamin, my cousin Marlene Green. I, I got a lot of, I was very influenced when I came up here by, my, by, by Marlene Green, and there's a documentary on her actually, um, because she was very much part of that. I, I'm activism situation and people were being shot. Young black guys were being shot and a lot, a, a lot of stuff was happening. So there was a lot, a huge movement to squash all of that racism in those days. And so that's what I met and I was in the middle of it and uh, co-directed Black Theatre Canada with Vera Kojo and all our plays were original plays. Ex well, original Malfini was a play written by um, Derek Walcott's brother, Roderick Walcott, uh, who died pretty young. Um, but the plays had to be written because there were no plays for us to use. <laughs> there were no plays for us to use. So we had to, for the type of theater Black Theater Canada wanted to do. I have to make that, that the difference, okay? because um, Jeff Henry was doing different types of plays, black plays. And we wanted to be making certain other types of statements. 
So we had to have original plays written. And of course, they were written by all kinds of people, black people who really had something to say. So really and truly, what, I, what we meant was a lot of resistance that ebbed little by little by little when people began to more and more and more accept what we were doing. When it came to funding, <laughs> it was ridiculous. When we would be given $50,000 to do a production, the other companies would be given $250,000, $350,000. They would demand certain types of box office from us and not from the others. It was just phenomenal. There have been studies done on that. Um, that didn't stop us because you can't let those things stand in your way or you will never make headway. You've got to just keep on moving forward and doing what you have to do. And after a while, it gives, it does give, it does give. As far as Theatre in the Rough is concerned, I formed Theatre in the Rough in 1985. We were definitely a, a, a company for the positive imaging of Caribbean and African peoples towards a harmonious coexistence of peoples generally, because we do not live in isolation here. We interface with all other races and cultures. But what we wanted to do was make it plain that, that the racism was real. So we paralleled the racism in Canada with racism in South Africa where apartheid was still on. And so half the company was actually people from South Africa, the original African people, black people. And people like Tato Bereng, Cindy, uh, Cindy Swa was from Zimbabwe, she was part of the company. Uh, you know, Cindy Swa, South Africa, Vui Swa was from, from uh, Zimbabwe and part of the company. Tia Homa Singer, ooh, very, very powerful man. He, he made the statement, uh, <laughs> the psychological dislocation of black people. I've never forgotten that. But that was such an, an apt description of what was done with us, a psychological dislocation of black people, which was used to let us police ourselves and fight among each other. The shadisms and the textures of hair and the this and the nonsense, and we're still doing that. Uh, but we had some powerful people from South Africa who were part of the fight against apartheid. And that's why they were here. They, they had, had to flee. And then we had activists from the Caribbean. And we had activists from Persia, Taronia Bosnijad, who had had to leave her country and was very close to the South Africans because when she left Iran, the people who she met, who she could really reason with were South Africans who had had to leave South Africa. And we had two other activists, Jesse Cookie, who is a big time guitarist that you can just plug into the Google and you get his uh, name. He uh, was born in France, raised here, white Canadian, um, a white Frenchman, as you would say. And then Claire Denham, dynamic, dynamic young white woman, um, who was also born in France, got into a, a collision when she was a child. They moved her to a convent in, in England and because um, her parents died. And then she came here and totally identified with us. And uh, Aloma Mendoza, um, Jean, Jean uh, Sheen started a company called Shisamba Shiyuka. It was the professional dance company in the 70s. And um, brilliant, brilliant uh, group, mainly of Trinidad. And um, when in the, in the 80s, when uh, Jean handed over to Aloma Mendoza, she actually helped us with our very first production. While Judge Gregory Regis, he wasn't a judge then, he was a young lawyer, worked on our incorporation. Um, she was the, she partnered with us so we could get our first grant. And the first engagement we had was the anti-apartheid uh, festival that was uh, hosted by Harry Belafonte. Um, and that's, that's how we started. And we went through the schools. 
We went through corporations. We went through clubs. We were a touring company. We took the material to the people and we would do plays and experiential workshops to get people up on their feet to experience what it felt like and then ask them what they would do rather than tell them what to do. So some people like the grandparents, grandmothers said, oh, I must change the sort of stories I tell my kids. I have to make different type of stories. Other people would say, okay, I'm going to go to the grocery store and I know what comes from South Africa. So I will deliberately put that in my bag. And when I go to the cashier, I say, where did this come from? And they say South Africa. I take it and put it back and make a point. So people have their different ways of doing things rather than us telling them. And all our plays were original plays. For the younger ones, we did younger plays. I, I wrote a series on Kweku Anansi, which is out of uh, Ghana. And um, I used the character and wrote stories. So Kweku Anansi and Rescuing the Ant Kingdom dealt with us coming to this country and interfacing with largely a white population in the 70s. And the, the misunderstandings that occurred because of, a, of, a, of ignorance. We don't know anything about each other. And then how Kweku and Nancy never used violence. He always used wisdom to solve problems. And he used wisdom to bring them together. So that was one of the plays we taught. Oh, that taught hundreds of thousands of people. In fact, I took it to South Africa for conflict resolution with children and with adults. Um, so that's, that's basically. That's basically me and what I met here, uh, et cetera. Wow, thank you. You've just given us so much wonderful information. Um, we're just like absorbing it all. A question for you. Um, you, you spoke to me about this yesterday, but um, you know, when Theater in the Rough ended, why? Why did it need, or where, like, where were you at mentally, spiritually um, when the company when you stop, when you stop doing that work in that way. Okay, we were, we really, I mean, as if you hear the type of work we were doing. So getting funding was not easy. In fact, the last um, amount of money I got from the provincial government, I returned it because we had asked, we wanted to do a specific type of project, which we were going to ask the famous Miss Lou, Louise Bennett from Jamaica, who is, a national figure, not just in Jamaica, but in the Caribbean, yes, yes. Um, to be part of so that we could actually get people out of their uh, high rises and apartments in Jane Finch and those places and get them into workshop, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we needed a certain amount of money for it. And they gave us $10,000 and kept saying, oh, you're not, do I said, you know very well we can't do it with that. Why are you giving us that money so that you can say that we didn't do what we said? Oh, but you, I said, no, that's not happening anymore. You give us $10,000, you know it can't do anything. We will return it to you, which is what we did. We returned the money to them. Um, the Partnership Africa Canada, where I used to get a major amount of funding, um, we didn't like what was happening with Partnership Africa Canada. A lot of the people who, who backed us had left. And um, at one point they actually said, uh, they, they, they were making negative comments about black uh, about theater in the rough. And the people from, from, uh, from it was, Zim, was it Zimbabwe or one of the African countries wrote them and said, theater in the rough represents us. Amma Harris represents us. We want her to represent us. And they actually, I still kept, I kept the letter, said, you cannot speak for them. They're saying that to an African man who's the head of an organization. And so a number of us got together and really and truly took them to task. And so they closed Partnership Africa Canada as a funding agency. And um, it's a resource, it was a resource center. That was it. I don't know if they're still around. Uh, CEDA, the funding from CEDA became very small for that sort of thing. Public education funds for churches, et cetera, disappeared. So in other words, the sources of funds where we really got our funding from, because we got very little from the government, um, we used the box office and funding from these uh, NGOs, really and truly, 
to run the company. That was practically drying up. Emotionally, too, it had been quite a drain on me and the people who were working with me. Ivo Piku is somebody who I, whose name I must mention because Ivo Piku wasn't only on the board, but he was also somebody who he eventually was on the board, but he used to work with me in the, in the company. If I took a company over to British Columbia, he would take them up to North, to North Bay. I remember them, some of the performers saying, oh, Ama, when we got there, all we saw the tips of houses, all the rest was covered with snow, <laughs> you know? But he's the person that I could say, yeah, you know, he had as much invested as far as what was taking place so that I could trust him with the, with the theater. Um, so there is Cheryl, oh wow, Cheryl Pascal was right. She was uh, right there, right there with me, more than just an admin assistant. Bridget Ubochi, and she ran uh, the Jobs Ontario Youth Program that Zanina Kande uh, organized, which was placing youth into uh, career-oriented jobs. Um, that program, of course, closed when the Harris government got in. Um, so there were specific people, and then on the board, David Booth, who was also a very close friend and somebody who used to, who was one of the top people at OIZ as far as uh, drama and education. Dr. Marjorie Ross, uh, Sunset Roach, Raynal Austin, you know, um, I have to mention those people because they were so important. Jean Augustine, who, you know, Jean Augustine, Zanina Kande, people like that who helped us with the lobbying were just out of this world, you know? Um, you, you, you need a family, you need an extended family. We worked based on culture. We worked with an extended family. An extended family we knew was there to support us. And it became very clear at one point that too much pressure was being exerted on the same people. And it was time for me to make a move. Uh, spiritually, I felt I was being guided to go back into the school system because I'm also a teacher. And I write, I write plays, and I, I, I needed to get that contact back with the children to hear what are they thinking? Where are they going with it? I also needed a pension because I literally had no money. And the board members and myself had to actually use our own money to pay for some of the stuff that was going down. And um, I said, okay, this is the time. The last big project we did, we went to South Africa. So we began with South Africa, the anti apartheid Festival, and we ended by being invited down to South Africa. Um, as far as I know, we were the first Black-led and definitely Black woman-led organization to be asked to come down to do conflict resolution. Apartheid was supposedly over, and I say supposedly, and uh, so we went down, it was, in, it was incredible. It was difficult because you could still see <laughs> apartheid, uh, although in, in name it wasn't, but it was an incredible experience. Nise Melenge uh, really was very, very strong with that. And I'm trying to, yeah, um, oh boy. No, thank you so much, Ama, that was, yeah. that was so okay. great. Okay, all right. <laughs> as I said like we we could speak for hours such a wealth of knowledge and I'm so glad you you remember <laughs> you know the the your memory is just so great to remember these specific names where people were coming from their circumstances um yeah I hope I hope uh, Lisa, as there's, you there's, do. there's one name though I, I I was trying to remember Lisa oh, uh, she she was she's the niece of Reverend Tutu and she was very, very instrumental in bringing us down to South Africa along with Nisi Melenge. And I need to mention her name. And she's, I think she's a professor at one of the universities. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll find her name. Um, I'm just so inspired because uh, the, the journey that you talk about, uh, personally, I've just been, I like, I go between activism and I go between art. Um, and it's always a beautiful space when they meet, but they don't often. And I, <laughs> they don't always and often, you know, Sapama is one of those spaces where they meet. Um, but what you're talking about was just like, there wasn't as much of a division, you know, that we were 
artists, activists, active, like it, it, there wasn't a division, like they were so much more integrated together. And I mean, that's something that I would like to see more of because as a theater artist, like there's a space where I've navigated my entire life of, of the careerist, you know what I mean? It's like, I gotta get to X institution, this grant, this thing. And um, for me, that's never been enough it's never been enough and never will be enough. And, and I know why, because I come, there's a whole legacy where that wasn't the case because there wasn't a career path for us to follow. The art had to be about something. Your, it had to be about more than trying to get to Stratford, <laughs> you know, trying to get produced by this or that company to find validation, you know? And so I just to put that out there for black artists, all artists who are watching this right now, like for us to remember that our work is important. And as, as much as we wanna transform these institutions to be spaces where we are welcome and celebrated and affirmed, we also have something greater to do than that. Um, so anyway, Bakambe, tell me about some of the challenges that you're experiencing or things that, things that you wanna talk about. Sure, and thank you for sharing that. Um, the three, I've had so many people support me over my journey. And so I, I wouldn't be anywhere without any of those people, but I've definitely had some shenanigans and challenges that I'll share with you. Um, and there's kind of three that are sticking out to me. So one was uh, procuring funding for my first solo, which is a Chitenge story. So a Chitenge story is an autobiographical solo show that chronicles my journey of healing from childhood sexual abuse first professional like playwright playwriting premiere um Macambe, that's your that was my <laughs> no one said to you okay do you want to start a little lighter <laughs> <laughs> like, go big or go home yeah yeah but no it's fair um, it's fair yeah, yeah it just um and and I had all of this beautiful support with which to create this um and, and create it slowly I started in theater school and it was sort of it wasn't about that and then it was, and then I realized it was always about that. So cool, 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 cool. Got it together, went, put on my little brave pants and I was like, hi, feminist theater in Calgary. I wanna pitch you a show, which I had never done before, but I was like, YOLO. I mean, the worst they can say is no, <laughs> really. So, and then the lady was like, okay, yes, we'll do it. I was like, really? <laughs> All these things were falling into place. So I had to apply for my first um, grants. I applied, so this is when I was still in Alberta, so I applied uh, provincially to the um, like provincial funders, Alberta Foundation of the Arts, and then I applied to Canada Council. Um, I had such a hard time with the AFA. Um, there, like, there was just like a real lack of warmth and understanding and like empathy and like, what are you doing here? <laughs> um, when it came to like a technicality, which was completely unclear that they basically disqualified us from funding, from like receiving funding that round. So uh, how do I explain? Like, so you apply for a grant and then you have grant officers who are like the people in the office who you call to be like, when is this due? How do you do this part of the website? Then you have the jury and the jury is a group of people who actually read the applications and they're like, this project, um, is interesting or meets this criteria of this grant. So this is what's gonna get funding. So the issue that I had was not with the jury because the jury ended up choosing to fund my project. The issue I had was with the grant officer who said that a key, um, I enlisted my director who is a wonderful human named Catherine Smith um, within the, within the um, grant application. And then, but I was the producer, Catherine was, um, applying for funding for a different project. And they said that we couldn't do that because that was two projects at the same time. And they accused us of trying to cheat the system. And I was like, ma'am? I was like, that doesn't... Hey? and I was like, like, okay. if it's in the fine print, my dad's a lawyer. We, <laughs> we, learned, we learned not to trust in reading the fine print. But, the, but it doesn't stay that like it wasn't like it was something that was clearly debatable. Here are these <laughs> like young straight out of theater school, diverse like artists, like doing our best. We put together a phenomenal application. <laughs> 
And like Canada Council didn't have problems, but like I couldn't get funded within my province because homegirl at the granting office was acting some sort of way. And there was, we just had no support. So, and that was the trouble that Catherine and myself had who are, who went to theater school. So therefore had an understanding of like what the theater landscape was, knew, had people to look over our application. We speak, like I speak English as, you know, my dominant language. I have a sense of, like there was a sense of support. And even though we didn't receive that funding because they wouldn't let the application go through. They're like, oh, it's okay. So what you can do Makambe, is this $14,000 you applied for? Um, you can just apply for the next round. I'm like, uncle, how? The show is in a few months. Mm -hmm. So how, so do you think that, uh, thank you for thinking that I have 14 grand lying around, but like you're screwing me over. So if Canada Council had not come through with that grant and that's solely what we used to fund the project. So I feel like um, just that lack of, first of all, being criminalized for trying to get funding to make art um, is, that sucks and that's not what was happening. And I also just think the power dynamic of somebody who sits in an office using tax dollars to pay their rent, which I'm paying their tax dollars, they get a salary and I'm here applying for some small, small money to make a show that empowers black women's healing to, to be paid once. And like the power dynamic, that, that stinks to me. Um, I don't like that at all. So that was like, that was really, really challenging, but I'm so grateful that AI was encouraged to apply for multiple streams of funding so that I was still able to do a production I'm really proud of. And I know that Catherine's really proud of and that I had people around me and that the company who was presenting the show offered me the opportunity to be like, okay, like we'll present the, we'll present the show. This is what this means, but you'll produce the show. And so I was given like really special learning opportunity. So luckily I was given tools to be able to overcome that challenge. But what bums me out is that not everybody is given those tools. Like so it's, true. So, it's so hard to navigate the system. And I'm like, why is it hard? It's literally for me. It's literally mine. If it's not mine, then who, like, you know what I mean? If it's not for the 20, the 20 something year old black girl magic coming out of theater school, who is the system for? Well, I we could know. answer that question. Well, I, yeah, I don't know. Yes. I, I hear you. And I mean, honestly, like I recently sat on a jury for the Canada Council and, um, you know, there were very few black projects that came through, you know, I'd say like 88, there's very few that are even applied. You know, so the fact that you applied, it's a big deal because people can't, as you said, even get to the space where they understand the system um, to be able, or that it, how it applies to their work, you know, like it's very difficult for people to even get to that point. So it's like, it's, it's, it's special. <laughs> and so yeah. you not to say it's special, special, but like it's important. And what you were talking about is important. So they should find ways to fund you as opposed to ways of trying to disqualify your application. Um, and, you know, sitting on the Canada Council jury too was wonderful because I just got to see, you know, read all kinds of applications, but I know that the fact that I was even there is because of so much activism that had happened before yeah. where they understood the importance of a black person being on a jury and what that and what that means and how important it is. Um, and so, yeah, just huge shout out to that because like Canada Council is an example. I remember there's that whole stand firm initiative, um, which people had to fight for, you know, black people, racialized people, indigenous people had to fight that for the councils to recognize the disparities, to address them, to give us funding. Like it's just been such a fight. Like speaking of the challenges that both you and Emma have spoken to of, of what we have to go through to make our art, um, to say something, to share things with the community. Um, and those challenges continue in many ways, you know? Um, so there's still, still work to do. At least in Toronto, we can talk to, they, you know, they just started the, um, the, the Black funding stream at the Toronto Arts Council. Um, and, you know, they had to make some changes to that in terms, not changes, but they really had to make it so that Black people would apply, which they did, I think, in large numbers, you know, and so we're just hoping that that, that funding continues, that it is increased, um, you know, and maybe even we can get to a point where people get their answers pretty quick. I actually think people did hear pretty quick back from that. I think they might have applied in September or something and might have heard by December, which is pretty great, because um, usually you hear back in like five to six five months usually so such a long time but yeah I mean 
our work needs to be supported. And I just sitting on that, I just was like, so few applications came from black people or black women. And I just want to see more people applying um, and more people creating things and saying what they need to say. And I just, I'm like, what do we need to do as a community, you know, to uplift folks so that, so that people's work is funded and they can get it, get it out there. Because the issue is when it's not funded, what we have to work so hard is that, you know, we all risk burnout, you know, which is on some level what happened with you, Ama, like at some point, <laughs> yeah. you know, we run out of energy because of dealing with the systemic racism that's just daily, dealing with um, the granting bodies, those kinds of ridiculous conversations that we have to have and giving back grants, like dealing with that and then trying to make the art and like trying to keep ourselves and our families trying to and our, those we love, like trying to care for everybody. You know what I mean? Like doing all of that, <laughs> Ooh, you know, like it's a lot. And I, you know, yeah. How do, how do we sustain the work, you know? And a part of it needs to be that a lot of the barriers that exist needs to just actually go away because they're artificial, you know, like they've only, they're systems yeah. that we've created. Therefore they're systems that we can dismantle and sy systems that we can change so that they can actually, you know, meet the needs that we have. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay, so what a good question that I have uh, for you, Makambe. What do you hope others will learn from you and your journey and your work thus far? Like, what do you hope people will take away? I love this question very much. Um, <laughs> as a future ancestor, <laughs> as we all are. <laughs> uh, oh, I can't wait till I'm an ancestor. I'm just, I'm going to be. <laughs> like guiding every I'll be just giving people little sprinkles of magic and just like, apply to this thing or like go left instead of I'm like I'm in there so everybody coming after me I mean it's great that I'm alive but when I die oh young people are gonna have a good time because I'm gonna be I'm gonna be cheering from their side um <laughs> what what I would love for people to know or learn from me I realized that anything that you want to do ever, there's always a path. Like, li like literally anything, that, like literally anything that you want to do, there is a path. Privilege means that some people have five steps to the thing that they want to do, and then others have 20 steps. But there is a path. Um, I don't think it's fair that we all have different amounts of steps. And how many steps are a part of that path is going to change according to what's going on in the world. Um, if we're speaking, for example, about theater, who's running these funding bodies, um, what audiences look like, what spaces we might be accessible to. But I think that every single thing that we want to do, there's a path. And sometimes we think that there's not a path because we can't actually physically see the path. Um, Sedna, you had mentioned like, um, a lot of theater uh, folks or like actors specifically having dreams of like finishing theater school and kind of like, there's this idea of like, the, the idea of success as an actor in Canada is like ending up at Stratford. And like for some people like that's a, there's a path to that. And I can understand why that makes sense to people because like, I feel like we've seen versions of what that path would look like. But I guess what I'm trying to offer is that there's other things that we want to do. There, there are ways that we can dream way bigger in theater in terms of like institutions, in terms of the kind of work we make, in terms of who we make it for, how we present it, um, how it can cross different disciplines and like whatever it is that you want to do, I promise there's a path. I think that our job is just to remember that there is a path even when we can't see exactly what that path looks like, but you kind of only need the next step um, in order to pursue it. So like figure out a way to go for what you want. Even if the path is longer than it should be, there's a path. Yes, you're right. I, I feel that. I feel that deeply. Yes. And you know, the path is uh, winding. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the path is slippery. The path is, we didn't shovel the path and then it iced over. It's iced and, and you, you slip, slip and, you and your know, tailbone hurts. But you get back up. But, there, but there's a path. There is a path. There is. And like, both of you, um, Ama, I'd love for you to answer this question too, but both of you have both spoke to being like, this was right. This happened at the right time because I needed to tell these stories or these need, these things need to happen. I think that's so powerful. Like that, yeah, the what we're doing is bigger than ourselves. You know what I mean? And it's mm -hmm. is greater than 
<laughs> is the stories that we need to tell need to come out is what I feel like they um and they have a power to transform us spiritually you know what I mean yeah. um to speak to a moment to um as black women I just see that through our work always like always you know it's just like it's about even whatever it's about it still is just like at its core it's like a little bit transformational or a lot you know mm -hmm. but Ama tell me um I'm sure you've thought about this question like what what do you hope others learn from you okay <laughs> okay uh just got to mention a couple of things even before I deal with that. Um, the name I was trying to remember was Yulisa Delamba. Yulisa Delamba and Nise Melenge were the two people from South Africa who actually brought us, along with what I was able to do here, brought us into South Africa. Powerful, dynamic people. Um, and then I've also got to say people like Salome Bay who is an African-American, married to a man from the Caribbean, came here and didn't sit down and wait to be asked, although she was asked to perform. She did incredible uh, dinner theater with Len Gibson and people like that, it was fantastic. And there's somebody called Georgia Brown, who actually is an African-Canadian who also had a theater before there. And before that, Kay Livingstone was a dynamic giant. People should, should they really need to, uh, investigate Kay Livingston. You know, she was a dynamic, powerful person in the arts. The hair, what I want to say is this. What do I want people to take away? I want people to take away the fact that we are more than theater. We are beyond theater. Theater is simply the vehicle that we use to assist in transforming people's lives. Because of the cultures we come from, we are theater also. All aspects of theater, whether it is dance or acting, storytelling, everything. And we put it together. I remember when Trey Anthony did her work uh, down, was it the Royal Ant, um, uh, the Royal Alec or the Princess of Wales? I remember <laughs> reading one of the comments and it, it amused me because this particular critique critic was criticizing it based on European theater. But if I were to critique European theater based on African and Caribbean and theater from India or China, then there would be a mess. <laughs> you, you have to have respect for where the person is coming from before you can think that you can critique what they are doing. So, we are complete human beings. I see us all as spiritual beings, blessed by God. And every difficulty we get, we say, yes, thank you, God. I wish I didn't have it, but this is going to show me what strength I have. It's going to bring me face to face with the strength that I have in me to overcome. I actually received that from a friend this morning on WhatsApp. And I thought, yeah, I've got to say that. I've got to say that we are more than theater. Theater is our vehicle. Film is our vehicle. Film is simply what we put our theater so that we can reach as many people as possible. Radio is another part of our theater. And we must always remember the, there are people who came before us and there are people who came before them. And we, it's not just a saying, it's a fact. We walk on their shoulders. And the day we disrespect that, and we cannot stand up and joyfully acknowledge those people, we have a problem. We are not going to be as big as we could be as human beings and not feel as self-fulfilled as we could be because we're just doing this little thing around ourselves rather than being part of this huge universe that has been given to us. Glory to God. Hey, that was, was so beautiful from both of you. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking of me from 20 years ago uh, being in theater school and feeling so feeling like just like 
isolated on some level. I had friends. I was, I was good, but still just feeling like alone, you know, as a, as the only black person in the school for a while out of like four years of theater school. Um, and I wish I'd known that then, but it's okay. I know it now that like, there's such a legacy and then there's such a community uh, of folks who've been doing this work um, and that there's more to it than, than art for art's sake, you know? That what we are theater and we have a responsibility um, to our craft and not in a way of just so that we can say it's excellent but so that you know we can move people and and be a part of a transformative spirit i just yeah i just wish i knew that black theater canada existed <laughs> when i was in school i didn't you know like i i knew about obsidian maybe and maybe about black theater workshop but i didn't know about all of the the folks that existed before um and uh and are still here many of them you know uh so thank you so much both of you I'm very inspired um but yeah, what, speaking of inspiration, my last question, um, uh, I'll put this to you, Emma, but like, what are you seeing right now? And you talked about this a little bit, um, but if you want to expand on it a little bit further, what are you seeing right now that's really inspiring you in terms of uh, what, what you know about Black art movement in, in Canada and beyond? Wow. Um, the, the young lady sitting with you inspires me. Aw, Makabe. <laughs> yeah. You inspire me. Uh, when I see young people going in the direction that says that they are beyond a little tiny circle, that they are part of a culture that is so huge that they are the vessels through which so much learning can come. That is an incredible inspiration for me. That makes me feel huge. <laughs> that makes me really excited. Um, when I taught at Gordon E. Brown, where I was for 16 years, I took theater into the school and the young people were so exciting. I enjoyed teaching them uh, because I used to use theater to teach science because they had to make the molecules speak to each other and do different dramatics to prove to me that they knew the science principles. Oh, and the kids loved it. And they loved it and I got more inspired and they got more inspired and I got more inspired. And the children, I love children. Children just inspire me. Children inspire me. Young people inspire me when they are doing what, in my perspective, allows the world to become a better place because that's what it's about you know we i think we were we were made different so that we could complement each other different races and different cultures well there's a human race and then there are all these different ethnic groups around the world and then we were different because we were supposed to complement each other not you know, challenge each other and I'm better than you. And no, we missed the point. <laughs> We're supposed to complement each other and become even greater. We are not the size that we are supposed to be. And when I see young people doing what they're doing, Black Lives Matter, when I see them doing what they're doing, they're brave young people, I, I say, yes, yes, we, it will happen. It will happen. I want to apologize for the fact that you all did not see what you did in writing and couldn't just go and find it. But that's because the older people were so busy doing the work. We did not have the luxury of sitting down and documenting. So it is only now that we are starting to do something like that. When I spoke to you, I said, ah, I should have really documented Theater in the Rough, but I was so busy doing the work, not having the sort of money. I did not have uh, funding. I did project to project. We were a full-time theater, but there were no breaks because we did not get funding. Uh, we did the operational funding. <laughs> they never gave us operational funding. That's a nice way to be able to destroy you is project by project. I pull your project fund and you no longer exist. Eh? 
Uh, so that sort of thing is the stuff that I say when I watch young people in this day and age fighting the way they're fighting to make things happen better, not just for themselves, for their children, for us, and for beyond us, because we are part of a macrocosm. We are component of life. And when we do in our area what we're supposed to do, then we're contributing to the growth of life that is supposed to happen. Wonderful. Um, I just want to respond and no need to apologize. If I were to blame anybody, which maybe isn't helpful, but I'll do it anyway. If anything, I, I feel like the accomplishments have that white people uh, who are in many cases responsible for educating us have been incredibly deeply anti-black racist A and B irresponsible in not transmitting this important knowledge and events. Um, they've acted like it doesn't exist. Um, so, you know, as an educator, especially in as, uh, you know, as educators, when they come across students from various cultures, I would feel personally my responsibility to find out about their cultures so that I could help them and steer them in the right direction so they would know, you know, um, instead of not just the most obvious, not just the governor award general winning place, which those two, but there's, there's more of that, there's more. It's a yes and situation, you know? So please don't, um, let us all take up the responsibility of learning and growing and sharing um, so that this information is transmitted to as many people as possible and not just black people, but everybody. Um, but Makambe, tell me, <laughs> what, what, uh, what, what are you seeing right now that is inspiring you? Uh, Miss Emma, you inspire me too, so there's that. I know, um, you inspire us. Wow, 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 wow. And what I find really validating is that just like hearing your story about coming to Canada when you came and it just, I love hearing that we had the same instincts, like that it's like, need to create, I am a creator, I am the creation, gonna figure out a way to do that and then just doing it. So that's like super validating because I'm like, mm, you did that and you're really cool and really smart. So I feel like I'm also doing something right if within my little <laughs> University of Lethbridge space, I, I had the same impulse. And what's a, amazing to me about this time is that we're finding so many people who have the same impulse and being like, wait, there's more than three of us. Um, so let's get together and make magic. Um, so I just wanted to say that. And what's really inspiring me right now, I'm really blown away by it. I don't know if I have any like profound offerings, but I'm really inspired by social media, TikTok, Instagram reels, like specifically of like black youth, just like the dances and like the makeup and the, and the like, I forget what you call them. Cause I'm also now, I'm not so good at social media, but that thing where like you play an audio and then you like sort of like do a voiceover. It <laughs> reminds me of how like creative, um, how creative we are, how creative our young people are. And it's like, it's just so cool to be able to have a really accessible outlet that people can be creative and share that juice. So what that makes me excited for as specifically a theater creator is just like, oh yeah, um, sh shout out to we are theater. That's so true. I'm really, 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 really uh, energized by that right now because I'm like, I see you out there. I know you're creative. Not only do you make stuff, you also like to consume stuff. So now I'm excited for how to get us all into a room because the most important thing, which is that we are all creative and creations and that we want to share space together is already existing on a phone. So we can do it in downtown Toronto or wherever the heck we want to do it. Yeah, that's giving me a lot of joy and magic right now. Yeah, I, I hear you. I'm very inspired by social media, um, the TikToks, the TikToks, the Instagrams, the dances. And there's My goodness, so the much. dances, like the lip abundance. syncing, the, the political education. 
you know, it is just like, uh, like bursts of creativity, the, the call outs, the call ins, you know, like all of it. It's just like black people, um, are really leading the way in terms of, um, creative and inspiring content creation on the internet is like we just take all of the, the the like enormous legacy that all of us have and we we use the internet to also say what we want to say say whatever it is you know what I mean um I learned so much from that and uh I yeah I, I'm inspired by it and yeah all the things it's, it's just wonderful I hear you um but with that we're at four o'clock oh my gosh we did so well for a time look at me <laughs> y'all I have ADHD and you know I'm also black so you know being on time you're amazing is, Edna. thank you so much for it's facilitating like, you did great it's huge you know what I mean like it is a big deal so I'm like praise praise ancestors you know things went so beautifully but yes thank you Makambe for for um for being here and for sharing your knowledge and just like also you know everybody you just give a shout out last one last time for your play. <laughs> Our fathers, sons, lovers, and little brothers. Toronto, Vancouver, yes. Montreal, yes. Hamilton. Yes. Don't, forget what? don't forget about Hamilton. Can't wait to see you all there. <laughs> and Ama, thank you so much. We, uh, I, yeah, I am glad you were available. I'm glad that you were here and um, I can't wait to, I will interview you more. So don't worry. <laughs> There's more to say, you know, this is what you're talking about basically is a book. Like it's a book that just needs to be out in the world. Um, it, it, it just needs to happen, but we'll start slowly, you know, little by little, your life, your legacy, your dedication to education, your dedication to theater, you know, is why we're all here today. So thank you. Thank you so much. Deep, deep gratitude. And also you need my father. So special points, <laughs> special points for me, not special points for you, special points for me. <laughs> I'm lucky. You know what I mean? That, that I should meet somebody who, who knew him and, uh, you know, I hope, I hope he's proud of me. So anyway, thank you all so much for being here. Um, a huge thank you to Kevin Ormsby, um, and to, uh, to Charles Smith and to Victoria Glitzer and to the whole Sopramo team for this gathering. Um, and huge thank you to Kevin for asking me to be here. A quick shout out for the Black Pledge, theblackpledge.ca. Um, and you can find me on all the socials. Um, sometimes I share things. <laughs> I need to get up on that. 2022 goals. All right. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.